making it open. Uh, Google has provided not just one Dan, but two Dans to help us uh, navigate that space. So I'll hand over to Dan Nadassi. I'm, I'm Bentley. Bentley. <laughs> and, uh, hey, I'm Dan, Dan Bentley. Nadassi. That's uh, Dan Nadassi, who should come up, because um, we're both going to be talking. Um, so we're talking about open sourcing existing successful closed source projects. And this is a really different challenge than just making an open source project, because uh, the code's already written, which is a lot of the work. So, but there's also successful projects. You know, They mainly have three contributors, but those three contributors, because they work 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week on it, are really doing great work. Uh, and so it's, not, it's, it's a very different challenge, which we'd like to talk about. Uh, and I think the big point here is that we want feedback. We've done this a lot at Google, and we'd love to know how it is at other places. And if you have stories or war stories or anything to share, please um, you know, uh, just shout out your comment or raise a hand or throw a shoe or whatever, because we would like to get uh, your perspective. So. Um, so, uh, just a bit about me, or oh, a bit about us, I guess. Uh, so, Dan uh, works full time in the open source programs office, and this is sort of what he does: is is uh, helping Google to release code and make open source better, and, and, and various other cool things. And I do it in my 20% time, so uh, roughly uh, one day a week, or one week every month, or something like that. I'll I'll spend a bit of time uh, helping doing open source stuff. And I got into this uh, in 2008, uh, mid-2008. Uh, someone uh, started a little open source group in Sydney and said, let's try and help the local open source communities, open source stuff from the Sydney office and so on. And I found out that a lot of stuff was blocked um, on one particular product, which is uh, what's now known as Clojure, or Clojure Tools, um, uh, to be precise. So. Uh, Internally, so Closure Tools, for those who don't know, is comprised of uh, a JavaScript library, um, which provides uh, a large sort of supply of various different forms of functionality, um, sort of similar things to the sort of stuff you'd found in jQuery, except a bit, bit more um, sort of uh, heavyweight and intense. Um, but jQuery is if you want to add functionality to a website. Closure Library is if you want to build a web app. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. And uh, you know, it, it has a large supply of functionality for all of the sorts of stuff we build at Google. So it's got the wrappers around um, Ajaxy communication stuff for building various sorts of widgets, all, all of this sort of stuff. Um, there's the compiler. Uh, I'm trying not to spend too much time on this because it's sort of getting away from the point, which uh, is very, very good for those who haven't tried it. It's um, essentially if you want to minify your JavaScript in an effective way and also do various cool things like uh, strongly type checking your JavaScript and so on and so forth. And uh, a few other things in the Clojure Tools suite. And so back in 2008, um, uh, I had sort of gotten into this uh, open source thing, found out that this was blocking it, and, and I wanted to release this project. Um, and sort of the, the process that I went through, I think, is a bit instructive for sort of how this has worked in the past and, and what we've tried to do to, uh, to fix it, which is why I want to sort of tell this story. So I uh, started out, um, and I happened to know the two guys who were maintaining Clojure, uh, the Clojure library specifically, and they were two guys who were maintaining it in their 20% time. So, you know, they already had their hands full doing lots and lots of stuff already, and they were maintaining this uh, huge thing which already had, you know, 400 different contributors from across Google. Um, and so I emailed them and said, hey, look, has anyone tried to open source this? Um, and they said, no. Um, well, I mean, we've thought about it, but, uh, you know, we have no time. Uh, if you want to, go ahead. And so I said, well, okay, how hard can it be? Uh, <laughs> And uh, so I sent an email out asking for help, and, and, and one other engineer, Nathan Nays, decided to help me out, and a, a tech writer very kindly decided to lend his time on the documentation stuff. Uh, that was David Westbrook. And uh, so we continued on. And you know, we, we came across the whole gamut of challenges. So um, fortunately, getting buy-in was not too hard. Uh, people were generally pretty keen on open sourcing this thing, which, which, which was a nice first step. Particularly, um, Google has this sort of thing where they want, we want to make the web better, for some sense of better. Um, 
and and you know so obviously releasing tools for people to build web apps that are effective is part of this you know sort of border goal and um, so not too hard to get buy-in from management um, a little hard to convince my manager to spend a lot of time you know um, over over a sort of a decent uh, few months uh, working on actually you know putting the pieces in place to do this um, and at the time, uh, Closure Library hadn't actually, uh, sorry, Closure Compiler wasn't actually being open sourced. So well, I'll get to that a bit later. Uh, then we went through the process of sort of preparing it to, to put it in the public domain um, with the initial sort of minimum bar um, of, you know, getting the code out there. We're like, we can get the code out there and then let's, you know, try and actually get some contributions later once we've proved that we can actually sort of, you know, get this thing out without, you know, any, any major problems. So we built, you know, stuff to strip out comments uh, that mentioned Google internal products and all of that sort of stuff. Um, we built things to, uh, uh, you know, strip out all of the, you know, Google copyright headers and attribute it with the right license and the right authors and so on and so forth. And all of these little niggling engineering tasks. In 20% time, this takes a couple of months, um, even though the total sum of work is not that huge. Um, and we get to a point where we're pretty much ready to open source and uh, someone up there comes down and says, okay, well, we've also got this awesome compiler that we, you know, want to release, and we've also got these awesome templates that we want to release, and this awesome, um, you know, uh, debugger, that uh, Firefox plugin that we want to release. And uh, so that delays us by about a month and a half. Um, of course, in the process of tying everything together, getting some PR out there, and all of this crazy stuff, making sure with legal that everything's okay, which was generally pretty quick. Um, although the naming for something like Clojure, of course, provides, you know, uh, its extra challenges. And, uh, and there it was, and then sort of, uh, so about three or four months after we initially sort of, uh, after I sent the initial email, we had code out there open source. And uh, under the Apache 2 license and uh, I guess it got some good initial press because we didn't really have too much trouble finding contributors. Um, so at this point, you know, sort of a couple of months after open sourcing, we have maybe 10 people who are contributing occasionally. Um, we don't have a community per se, but this is a very mature project. And so, you know, we were mainly looking to provide this as something that people could use rather than something people would uh, actively contribute to and build up and so on. And uh, and that's essentially it. And, and it's sort of stayed in maintenance mode. And there's been a small sort of continuing burden on engineers to, to maintain that little extra um, sort of uh, maintenance that, that's due to the fact that we're um, out in the open source. And the engineers have continued developing internally, um, the ones who actually want to contribute to it. <coughs> Um, and the ones who develop out in the open, we have a system which we're going to describe later for bringing their patches in and actually sort of unifying the two projects. Um, so that's sort of a rough picture of, of how it's all worked so far. Um, does major discussions take place on the open mailing list and, and you know, it's, it's sort of what you'd expect. Um, although because it's, a, again, it's a mature project, it mostly is uh, discussions about how to use the libraries and, and, and the compiler rather than how to improve them. And so that's it. Uh, and, and sort of, I, I think this is a good starting point for sort of highlighting the issues around uh, open sourcing. So, um, what was there? Like, uh, what are the things that we've identified, not only through this, but also through open sourcing our core Java libraries? Um, uh, Python, we've done a similar thing, open sourcing called Python libraries, and various other things. Um, as you can tell, we sort of focus on the very low level stuff because it's easier to separate that out from, you know, the Google infrastructure. Like, if we, we can't open source something B that depends on A without first open sourcing A, so. So this is the first problem, is that, um, Basically, it's very easy to get people to buy into the concept of open source and say, oh, well, if, if you open source something, it'll all be magical and every step to, you take towards open source will make your project better. Um, what it actually looks like is more like this. Um, so you've got a closed source project and then you go to open source it and at some point you have to sort of make this leap where you transfer for your, um, all of your code to the outside through some system 
Um, like there are various ways of doing this. You can either just pick up all of your code and you know, step to the outside, but then your engineers have to all learn the new um, source control if you've changed your source control system, which is often the case. Um, they have to at least deal with a new repository, often a new workflow, because they're having to deal with the outside and so on. So there's, um, in between this sort of uh, totally open space, which is magical and you're getting contributions from the outside and everyone's using your product and you're getting good publicity and it's wonderful. Contributions from unicorns. Yes. <laughs> and the closed source world where you're just doing your normal internal software development thing. Where well, you're moving really quickly and you are being really productive for having a three person team. Yeah. Um, in the middle, there's this thing where you're sort of trying to do both, and it's really hard. And I, I think that's really what the, what the sort of trough in the middle is. It's, um, it's nothing more than trying to do two things at once and doing both badly as a result. Um, so what we try to do, and specifically what Dan spends all of his time doing, is basically trying to raise this barrier so that you can actually sort of transition a project from the inside to the outside without having to sort of deal with this pain point in the middle. And you can get the benefits of open sourcing without uh, sort of struggling. All right, so step one. Um, and this is the part where we'd really like sort of input because, I mean, again, we've dealt with the Google cases, but, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of specific to us. So if anyone has input or, or experiences with this, we'd love to hear them. Um, so the first one is sort of the big one. You know, what's the business case for all of this? Uh, you know, if you go up to your manager and say, I'd love to open source this project, it's kind of tricky. It's... Uh, well, I, I, I think it's more that managers are often fine with a project being open source. Mm -hmm. Their problem is, what's open source going to take away? Because we have a successful project that's being really useful for, in our case, Google. If it's open source, are you going to spend all of your time, and is the whole team going to spend all of its time fixing bugs on you know Windows that don't matter to Google? And if that's so, so it's, I, I think it's just to be clear, it's not. Are you all right with it being open source? It's more often. Are you all right with engineers having to maintain open source? Yeah. A lot of engineers have heard, "Oh, you're fine with it being open source. Therefore, you must be fine with me spending all of my time on it yeah. being open source." Yeah. Which is really the case and something to keep in mind. Yeah, so this is what happened with Nathan in my closure story is, is after we open sourced, uh, Nathan had to spend basically his 20% time continuing to sort of uh, make blog posts, travel around to uh, uh, conferences and give talks, uh, uh, maintain the community just by maintaining the mailing list, answering bug reports and all of that sort of stuff, which was not part of his core job. Um, and so he needed to find time to do that. And of course, his time cost money um, for the company. So you need to be able to evidence this with things like you might get open source contributions. That's a big one. So that obviously, for every contribution you get, that's a contribution that an engineer doesn't have to make in your company. Uh, the other one that uh, I particularly like is um, by doing something open source, you contribute back to the community. And in, as with Google's case, if you have sort of some sort of overarching principle where you can say, by releasing this, it'll make the sort of environment better um, for engineers, and that's a good thing for our company. That's also a very compelling argument I've found. And it makes you know acquisitions and hiring easier if people already know uh, what you use internally. And you know, the underlying reason for making the web better by making it faster is that people will use it more. And we happen to think that we're a company that can. Uh, monetize people using the internet more. So our incentives are really aligned with a better internet, which is a convenient place to be. Um, this is this is an unfortunate one, and I'm sure it's probably something other people have heard. It, you want to start open sourcing something, but the engineers who work on the project, uh, or if you're working on the same project, then the other engineers will say, well, I'd love to open source it, except I don't really feel comfortable with the outside world seeing this code. And you know, it's, it's, it's code that's perfectly fine for internal purposes. It may be well tested. It may be you know, perfectly reliable, but it's not, it's not quite good enough. You know, there's hacks in there, and you don't really want to expose those hacks to the world and things like that. 
Um, and to me, this has always just been rubbish. I mean, Dan's had a recent experience with this. Yeah, then... utility trumps beauty. You know, if the code does what you want it to, it's better than the outside. It's better to the outside world having code that does it messily than the alternative not having code that does it. Mm. So, so we are trying to quash this. And I'm sorry about your pretty little egos, but like code that's not pretty but is useful uh, needs to get out there. So I've started giving people a month to like fix up whatever hygienic issues they think it has. So I, I now have an appointment on my calendar and on February 13th, I get to open source a, a new library with whatever <laughs> updates the maintainer has done before then. Yeah. How did you uh, get into that position where you were able to put that deadline on it? Um, by telling him that I was in that position, right? It turns <laughs> out that an awful lot of authority comes from uh, W words. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know how, how particularly well this carries over to various things. But if you can get authority from somewhere, either by claiming authority or by uh, uh, actually uh, getting buy-in from someone with uh, the power to do it, it helps a lot. Um, to just get over these humps that don't really exist. And the the other thing is that open source code is not that pretty either. Like it's it's. You know, it, it will be comparable to your internal code. Um, I, I'm not a kernel hacker, but uh, yes, during a talk yesterday, it was mentioned that uh, about the testing situation in the Linux kernel. And um, you know, at the very least, within Google, we have very strong testing practices about you know how each module is supposed to be tested, what testing framework we're using, and all of that, um, which seems a lot more consistent and well structured. So the not pretty enough argument doesn't seem to hold up under those conditions. Yes. So there's so also Google, a formal code review process. Yeah, no code gets checked in without another engineer saying yes, I agree. This is tolerable code. Um, so you'll slow down the project, and this is um, particularly this is related to the trough of productivity we talked about earlier. So basically, during that trough, uh, you're going to spend time and effort on the project itself. Um, which, which is something we'll deal with uh, in a bit. The other side of this, though, is actually sort of the myth that once you get into a stable open source state, people have to continue to invest a lot of effort in maintaining the project, um, much more so than they'd spend when they're just working on the project. Um, and it's true that there is a, little, a small amount of effort that people have to uh, put in in order to sort of uh, stimulate the community, make sure the community is particularly aware of what's happening internally, just as with any corporate investment in a open source project. Um, but the point is that the burden is nowhere near as high as people make it out to seem, at least in my experience. But I think this is a really relevant objection that, like, it's not a silly objection to have, right? Like a manager or a, a VP of engineering should be having this kind of objection because that's exactly the kind of thing they're paid to prevent. So you shouldn't go, oh, you idiot, and like punch them. You should like engage them and go, like, are these costs going to be too high? And can we talk about them? Handy tip. Yeah. Uh, you, you can. Feel free. Yeah. It, it may not work out well for you. If you're looking for another job, I hear Google's hiring. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'll have to make changes in two places. So this is, um, say you have a big code base and you want to open source part of your code base. Um, so this is exactly what we did with Clojure Tools. Um, then all of a sudden you have something like Gmail, which is built on top of Clojure Tools. And if someone wants to make a fundamental change to Gmail, not only do they have to make the relevant, uh, where they could have just made the change to Clojure Tools and Gmail at the same time, now they have to make the change to Clojure Tools, uh, wait until the patch gets downstream into the project, and then um, you know, sync it in, and then make the change in Gmail. Uh, which is definitely a valid concern. Um, one thing that we looked at when we were open sourcing Clojure Tools that really helped in this case is looking at actually how many changes are there that affect two places at once. And we found that there weren't too many because generally what people do with a fundamental library is, or, 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 or piece of infrastructure is they make the change in the infrastructure first and then they'll make the change in the project anyway. So that's not too bad. And the additional burden is just the sort of time taken to, to sync up. Yep. Yeah? Uh, so I work on 
Uh, I work on OpenSSH and it has uh, two streams of development. The core protocol stuff's done in OpenBSD and we periodically pull uh, changes into the portable branch. So there are open source projects that, that are already in this state. Great example, thanks. Yeah, and, and one of the other things is that um, in terms of things like the release time and so on, um, because you are actually open sourcing this yourself, you do have a great degree of control over it. So, so you can set sort of the re release expectations and the versioning expectations um, such that it's fast enough for your needs. Um, in the case of Clojure, for example, we're just pulling in every change, and we're fine with that, and that works for us. And obviously that turns out to be fast enough. Okay, step two, actually doing this. Um, uh, we're going to get um, in a little bit to the thing that Dan's been working on, which is sort of what makes this easiest. But just to give you a rough idea of the steps involved that we've had to go through, um, it's all of this sort of uh, crafty work. And it, it tends to be just writing a bunch of scripts to go over the entire code base and do, do this sort of stuff. But it tends to be fairly risky work because you're doing bulk changes to a lot of places. Uh, for example, when I, uh, one of the changes I had to make for Clojure Library was 1,500 files and 12,000 lines of automatically generated changes to the code base. And that's not something you want to like, mess around with because it can break a lot of stuff. Um, so yeah, be careful with it. Other than that, things like um, removing usernames, uh, removing dependencies you don't want to stick out, uh, removing you know internal versions of libraries that are no longer that are deprecated, which we have to keep around because we're using them, but we don't want anyone to use even internally. So removing all of that stuff is fairly easy to automate with a set of scripts. Um, but it it's just still non-trivial. Like for any decent-sized library, if you're going to take it and you want to take how you have it internally that you know is integrated with a lot of stuff, you just want to chop it. Whether you do it manually or automatedly, like just figuring out all the things you need to chop is non-trivial. Has anyone tried to do this? Yeah, it's it's frustrating. Yeah, it, it's an unpleasant process, and and it requires a number of, of of tries to 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 get it right. And the new build system for us was a particularly big one because uh, we use our own build system. So, um, getting it to uh, gel with uh, you know the outside world, it took a bit of effort. Not only does no one at Google remember how to write a make file, no one at Google knows what. I'm pretty sure Stu Feldman knows how to write a make file. <laughs> uh, knows what the trendy replacement for make files are nowadays. So it's really hard trying to get it ready. There's, yeah. All right. Uh, so now we, we've gone through the uh, sort of steps of getting buy in, which is the tough one, doing the sort of crappy engineering work in order to actually make this project releasable. Um, and we've released it. But as we sort of all know, this isn't an open source project yet. Um, it's sort of code that's sitting outside. And for some purposes, this is okay. Um, you know, if, if, it's a li if it's just a util library that you want people to, to up and use, then, you know, maybe you don't really want to build a community, particularly if it's a small thing that you, you know, you aren't maintaining anyway, even internally. Um, and your engineers are still working on the project like they've always worked on the project. Like you've got the ability at this point to release your code, but not really to interact with the outside world to take patches in a meaningful way. These are processes that you have to set up in some form. Um, the ability to like take a piece of code and actually put it in when the contributor is not part of your core code base. Um, you've got to sort out where code reviews happen. Um, you've got to figure out. Um, like, do we commit and then do a code review, or do we take a patch, commit it internally, and then push it outwards? All of these are options, and have various degrees of friendliness to your internal engineers, and also friendliness to the people who are trying desperately to contribute, but not, might not be able to actually communicate. Um, and I think that's one of the most important lessons we learned from Clojure, is like, the amount of communication is, is, is critical, which might sound uh, sort of dumb but, uh, or obvious, but uh, 
definitely having that communication line so that users outside who do want to contribute and don't know how or are trying to contribute and aren't able to get through have a channel by which to actually sort of ask what's going on. Um, you know, can I introduce this new module? Things like that. Um, what can we talk about in the open? You've got internal products. Um, you've, especially when you're doing this sort of bottom-up approach of releasing the fundamental libraries before the outside, uh, before the sort of things that depend on them, you've probably got things depending on them that you don't, that are sort of core business logic for your business that you might not want to get open, even though you can get sort of underlying things into the open. And so there's a question about, you know, do we maintain two mailing lists, uh, one internal for internal discussions and one external for the bulk of the discussions. Uh, stylistic clashes. So this hasn't actually come up too much in my experience. I well, don't know if... So, so my take on it is that there's a lot of rules and idioms that make a lot of sense at Google where we have you know this huge code base and so we have to make one decision and stick with it. And we make that decision on the basis of all of this code, right? Which is basically an iceberg. Then we take this tippy top of the iceberg and we publish it and people see that and they go, why are you using these crazy rules that make no sense? And the answer is yes, they may make no sense for that little bit of the iceberg, but they make an awful lot of sense overall. Um, and it can sometimes be really hard to say, well, no, we aren't going to, you know, like thank you for that patch uh, that completely changes, you know, the, the, fi the, the formatting, but we're not really going to take it. So everyone knows this by now. Um, in the room, which is uh, a lot of problems in this in this process of open sourcing something internal are going to be social problems. And they're going to be social problems that you encounter in every open source project, largely. Um, and you will have to solve them in the same way that you solve them for every other open source project. And it's simple as that. But, um, so, a number of these problems in terms of the things that are caused by having two interacting code bases particularly um, can be facilitated with engineering solutions. Um, and this is what Dan's going to go on and talk about is basically that you can make engineering solutions that at least help you along the way um, to sort of gel the two worlds. All right. Hey, um, so I'm going to be talking about... Uh, Make Open Easy, which is this tool I've been working on. Basically, at this point, you've reached the point where you have the, the code internal, you have the code public, and the choice is, where will the developers work? Well, a lot of people are going to say, well, we should keep working internal, as we always have, you know, and it's pros. It's what you're used to, and, you know, you have all these tools that are internal. You might go, oh, well, why can't you open source those too, right? And that's just, um, that just turns into an effort in, in yak shaving where you have all these tools that are built assuming they can run one way, and you can't just open source them all at once. So it is easier for developers to work internally. And if you still don't believe me, you should uh, catch me afterwards, and, and we can talk about it until one of our ears falls off. Um, but there's a con, right, where the public only sees code dumps. So if you're picking a library, one thing I do is I go and I look at the library's changes, and I go, like, how often has this been updated in the last month or two months? And if the answer is it has quarterly code dumps, I'm a lot less likely to use it than if I can actually see, oh, there's a developer who has been checking in four things in the past day. That means I can probably get a decent response and, and decent help. Um, also, the code dumps often stop happening because, you know, it's really hard to keep up with doing something once a quarter because you don't do it for a quarter, then you go back and, oh, you forget how to, and so you just stop. Um, so it's kind of look at, look at the first few uh, contributions to uh, the open source closure project. It's uh, there's a month and then something happens and then another month and something happens and in each change, you know, there's a bunch of changes, but you don't actually know what they are because the sort of the code is being thrown over the wall in that fashion. So the the response is all right. So we're just going to take this project, we're going to move it, and we're going to make it a public project. Uh, and this has pros, right? The rest of the world is included and actually feels like they can become a member of the community. Um, but the cons, right, it's hard for new internal contributors. And so, you know, I've heard a lot at Google, well, you know, like Googlers are smart. You know, like if we move from working in, say, Perforce to working in, say, Subversion, they can pick it up because Googlers are smart, right? And, and they are. And so it's fine for 80% contributors. And it's even fine for 20% contributors. 
But it's a real turnoff to your 1% contributors, who are people who just want to make one change. And those 1% contributors are where you get your 20% contributors, and it can be where you get your 80% contributors. Um, and so, and I think this is an important point. At the moment that you open source a project, the contributions from internal developers are so much larger than the contributions from public developers, because public developers have had no chance to work with the system, that under sort of any reasonable rational weighting, you're going to pick to keep internal. And, and I think that's bad, because it's hurting uh, public contributions. It's not fostering it. So the solution is to live in both places, um, which is why I've been developing Make Open Easy, or Mo. So basically, the concept is that one project leads different lives in different repositories. So I've put on the left here code as it might appear uh, inside Google, and on the right, yes, the right, my left, but uh, code as it would appear publicly. And you can see there are some differences here, right? And it's not that like the code that we want to strip out is like the be evil code. There's just various <laughs> stuff that happens, right? Like I put in here a uh, a, a second um, constructor that takes a buffer size. Maybe it turns out that like this class didn't need buffering at all. So we deprecated it. And it's not harmful, but we don't want to support it. With Mo, you can just throw the at internal uh, annotation on. And then when the code gets uh, sent out to the public, that gets stripped entirely away. Um, and so you don't have to worry about supporting deprecated code. Um, you know, at Google, we run a very homogenous environment. And so we write code that takes advantage of this to only look at things one way. Um, so, you know, at Google, we would just handle the Google form and assume that everything is ELF and 64-bit or whatever the actual uh, knob turn settings are. Um, whereas, you can, so you can tell Mo, hey, when it gets out, you know, like strip that part and then insert this code handle all. So when it gets sent outside to uh, the public, it really just says, handle all the formats. And these are uh, toy examples, but I hope they sort of show the motivation. Why do we have two different syntaxes for the four PSV and Well, because I'm dumb. Um, no, I'm just, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Great, great. Um, so strip works in any language, and you can strip sort of any amount of code or text, right? It's just like looking at code as text. But at internal, we actually integrated it with the Java compiler. So it's a Java-specific feature where you can annotate anything that's uh, annotatable, so a member, a method, or a class. And then you don't have to say end strip. It's just, so if you need to like delete part of a method, you can use uh, the second syntax. And if you just want to delete a whole class, um, it also like knows to remove the imports of the code that's no longer used. And it's all very and sometimes too clever. Um, so if you, once you have Mo set up with your project, what can you do? Well, the first thing is just to make a code dump. You can take whatever the, the latest version internally is and send it out, right? And that's sort of the minimum required to be at all useful. Um, you can do the other way. And uh, so if you, there's a library outside that you depend on, but we have to tweak it to get it to work with Google system. It used to be that you could do that once. And then if you ever wanted to update that library, you were up some sort of creek. Because, you know, oh, well, I made modifications, and you know, I had to change these lines to get to compile, and uh, I'm never going to do it again. So with Mo, you can also take the head uh, uh, publicly and bring it inside to Google. You can migrate each change in one repository as one change. And I'm going to show you this, and why don't I do that now? So this is Clojure Compiler, which uh, Daniel mentioned. It's a really great JavaScript compiler. If you have a web app written in JavaScript and you aren't using Clojure compilers because you hate your users. <laughs> um, and you can see here, in the last year and a quarter, there have been 736 changes in subversion. Right? And I can go and I, I can look at these. You know, and they're from today, eight hours ago. And these are you know, changes as you would expect them to appear as they were done. So if you're a user and you're wondering, hey, like, what does it take to contribute? You can see you don't have to make a month's worth of like 1,800 line patches. You can just make an edit um, and maybe, there, yeah, right? Like, hey, I just need to, well, that's a silly change, right? But like, this is the idea is that development often happens by way of silliness. 
And so we want to make people feel included. And so if you weren't at this talk and you saw this, you'd think, wow, this is a real project that's being developed in the open. I should use it because I have a chance of contributing. I have a chance of getting a response from an author. So this is a demo uh, by which I actually had to do nothing at the moment, which is great. The best kind of demo for me as a presenter. Um, other things you can do, and I've started them because they're still experimental. Um, you can take a patch against the public version of a code base, which, as we've discussed, may not be the same as the internal code base. Uh, and you can turn it into a patch against the internal code base. So what this does is, by way of magic, uh, undoes all the scrubbing and the modification of the code. And so you take a patch in a format that's easy for the patch author, and you turn it into a patch in a format that's easy for the code maintainer. Um, and so, you know, obviously there are all uh, sorts of complicated merge issues, but the idea is you automate what's automatable, and then you leave what's difficult for a human, because, you know, we still need jobs. We shouldn't let computers do everything. Um, and you can visualize the history of what's happened with the project and where changes happened and when they got pushed between uh, internal and public. Um, how, how much, what time is it? How much time do I have? have seven minutes. Seven minutes, great. Mo works, we'll talk about it never, um, unless you want to catch me later. Um, so I've shown you the Clojure compiler. We also have um, Google App Utils Python, which is just a set of libraries for uh, writing Python applications uh, easily and well. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to come and I'm going to run Mo with the, I'm going to run the auto command of Mo with this project Piglib, which is an internal name, and it's going to <laughs> tell me that I need to tell it who I am. So I'm going to do that. Um, I, yes, I am. Essentially, what Dan's going to show you is syncing the two code bases. So by the end of this, what you'll see is that Mo basically enables you to have two parallel running code bases, a perfectly functional open source code base, and an internal code base that is sort of the original code base, um, where your developers can continue developing happily. It can be part of a much bigger code base, as in Google's, uh, as in Google's case. And so you end up with a situation where the internal engineers are happy, and you are able to have a functioning open source project. And so we're going to let this run for a bit and come back to it. Um, you, the, there's also a bad visualization at, um, so for instance, our JS compiler, uh, Clojure compiler that we mentioned, is hopefully going to show me um, something. No, it's not. Um, there's, there should be lines here, and there aren't. Oh well. Um, but basically, the, yeah, that's pretty much it. The code's now open source, so you can go get it from Google Code. Um, if you have one project that wants to live in two repositories and you need any differences between them or you need to have in any way heterogeneous uh, source control systems, we have that a lot where some people really want to use Git, some people really want to use Mercurial, so, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Mo is the tool for you and it can be, it probably won't work straight out of the box, that's honesty, but uh, we can get it to do what you want. So, so come talk to us. Um, and now we're going to, oh yeah, uh, and we'd like to acknowledge people who've worked to get Clojure Tools open source, uh, Nathan Nays, uh, Nick Santos, and David Westbrook, and the 400 plus people who actually wrote the code at some point at Google without in any way having to bother about it being open source, and continue to develop it without worrying that it's open source. The only people who really uh, work on it are Nick Santos, uh, Dan Adasi, Nathan Hayes, these people who work as the bridge. And then for Mo, uh, David Borowitz did a huge amount of work to get it um, actually publishable and open. Uh, and so that, that gives us a little bit of time for questions or comments or doubts, dilemmas. Yeah, so at this point, Mo figured out that there haven't been any changes. But here's a command that you can just run every day, every week, and any changes that you've done internally can get pushed externally.
So you know, you just run it in the morning, and you have a live public project. Questions? Yeah. So you said that works with heterogeneous um, SCM. So say if you've got Git internally and you want to publish via Subversion or vice versa, it, it, it can handle that? So it can see the changes you made over the last two days and push them out to your public repository, which is a different type to what you're using internally? Yes. Now, obviously, there's going to be some information lost. You know, like it can't turn Subversion into a distributed version control system. And at the moment, it, if you're doing crazy things with branches, it, it just ignores it and just publishes it as a sequence, which can look very odd. But it, yes. Okay. Just a quick follow-up. Um, you had your syntax there for pulling stuff out of files. Is there something similar for whole files? Like if you've got um, proprietary library X, which you can't use yeah. externally, but you've got a replacement, f a different library that you're publishing internally, it knows how to pull out the proprietary, say, jar or other Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can specify um, that this file just gets deleted on the way out. Cool. Um, Right now, it integrates really well with our internal build system, which is obviously something that, you know, if you have any kind of build system, you'd want to integrate with two. We don't know your build system. You know, patches are very welcome. It's probably going to be easier to patch it than to write your own thing to do this. Yeah, so, so one thing that comes up at a lot of companies often is uh, legal concerns around, around what's going out, what's coming in. Um, and often there's review processes or steps in place uh, between, you know, effectively, in the middle of what, what your Mo stuff, all the stuff that goes either way would, mm -hmm. would often be reviewed in some sense. Do, do you have that sort of um, structure, or so, uh, are the lawyers happy to let the engineers work out? So when we take patches, we need people to sign a copyright license uh, yeah. assignment so that we know that we have the right to, to use it. Um, yeah, but it doesn't matter if they sign it and they've ripped it off, and it doesn't actually really protect you. No, but there's yeah. there's no such thing as protection, right? As soon as yeah. you leave the house, you're going to fall down and skin your knee. And so it's a question of, like, how do you optimize it? And the thing about Mo is that a lot of lawyers are actually reasonable people. So if you tell them, <laughs> many, uh, the majority are people. I'm um, struggling, I'm struggling. Uh, that, that a lot of times, if you have a process that takes, you know, two days, uh, and legal is one day of that, and the engineering work is one day, legal goes, well, we don't need to optimize this process because like, we're only half the time. So if you set up something like Mo and you get it down so the engineering work is 10 minutes, then you can go to legal and you can go to the VP and you can say, look, there's something that would take me 10 minutes that take me two days because of legal. Like That's often a better incentive for the lawyers to go, oh, wow, we really are interfering. Um, yeah. A anything else? Comments, questions, doubts, dilemmas? I see. Yeah. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of projects that um, we have talked about opening opening up to the public, and uh, the usual the well the main objection is um, um, it's going to take a lot of effort, and it's going to take a lot of uh, and it's also too there's too much local knowledge there. Um, uh, I guess that uh, it would be quite a daunting prospect to um, make a lot of the changes because I know there won't be a budget allocated for it. It would be a, a spare time kind of an activity. Well, um, you got any, I mean, I suppose using Mo is one thing. Um, does Mo, um, how, how do you actually make Mo aware of which part, which changes you need to make? You, there's a configuration for the scrubber, and you tell it, do this, don't do that, scrub these usernames, publish these usernames. But for me, what I like to do now is I've gotten it to the point where when there's a library, I can send out a draft of what a public version of that library would look like with about 30 minutes to an hour on my time. And I find that that inspires people. Rather than going, oh, we should open source it, oh, it'll be too hard. If I just send them a patch, and I show them, like, hey, these hundred lines make a library like this, instead of going, that's dumb, they'll go, you know, that's rubbish, it doesn't do this. You know, you need to add these lines. I'm like, well, like, great, thank you. You know, it's kind of like stone soup. If you just give people a base that they can add on, rather than talking about it endlessly, it makes it a lot more likely for something to get open. Um. 
Uh, yet another story from Closure. Yeah, so uh, it's something I didn't mention explicitly is a few months after uh, we had uh, originally open source Closure, we migrated to Mo because Mo had existed uh, suddenly. And so uh, that, while we spent several months actually going through the original process to open source Closure, um, in order to set up the Mo config, which was sort of equivalent to the work we had all done, took a couple of days. Um, so it's vastly simplified the process of actually doing all of that legwork. Yeah. Would you accept a broader Google open source question? And um, yes, but I reserve the right to table it. Um, from the outside, it appears that the uh, Open Source Program Office mostly operates as a marketing organization. Internally, does it provide consulting and enforcement um, to uh, projects, particularly the um, high-profile uh, projects where open source is of strategic interest, like Android, which is yeah, a well, dump and run project. Um, we have, and Chromium, but it turns out at this point, around. Android doesn't need much help from us because they have people who know how to do this stuff, right? Like uh, JBQ and Dan Morrill. You know, and we can talk about the quibbles you have, um, but um, I mean, yeah, I'd love to talk about it offline, but the answer is you're probably wrong. <laughs> in, 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 in that there is consulting and... There's consulting and I think there's a high degree of competence, but we should take this offline. Are there any other questions? Hmm? Oh. Great. All right. All right. Would you join with me in thanking the Dan's?